whenever you see unbelief, there's going to be sin. Whichever area you're struggling with sin, ask yourself the question, what do I not believe God for? Hi, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's such a pleasure to have you watch today's video. In today's video, I want to speak about why does God hate sin? And I want to clarify that it does not say God hates sinners. Because the reality is that God loves sinners, but he hates sin. Now, I want to talk about why does he hate sin? I know the first answer that would come to someone's mind is because God is holy and sin makes God kind of like unsettled or angry. Yeah, you can say that because God is holy and God is a God of justice and God has standard and God has a system whereby sin is to be punished. But when it comes to the true heart of God regarding sin and you, if you are struggling with sin or a sinner that does not even believe in God, how does God view that sinner? How is the relationship between God and that sinner? Because if you say God is holy, he doesn't want to have anything to do with sin, it means when you struggle with sin, God is not with you in that place. It means when you struggle with sin, God leaves you to your own self. And most times we are conscious of the holiness of God when it comes to do with sin. In this video, I want to introduce you to the God who loves sinners. One of the most popular verses in the scripture is John 3:16 that says, for God so loved the world. It did not say God so loved the perfect people in the world. Neither did it say for God so loved the righteous. But it said God so loved the world. Now what's the definition of the world? It means every human race, every human in the world, which means they are sinners, the ones that are saints, the ones that go to church and the ones who don't. But in the real sense of it, all human beings are sinners from birth. Why? Because of the sin of Adam. And you already know that if you go to church or if you read your Bible, that since man fell, which Adam and his wife Eve fell, every other man that was born was born in the image of Adam himself, which is the human nature, sinful nature. So now it's a reality that God really loves sinners, which is he loves the human being that he made. And scripture says in Romans chapter 5 that God demonstrated his love to us. It reads, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It means all of us were sinners. Even those that are believing in Christ today, we were sinners before we were translated to believe and be accepted into the kingdom of God. So one of the reasons that I've wrote down here is because sin is destroying the one that God loves. Everybody who's struggling with sin or who is a sinner has a fearful look towards God, such that the sense of God's love for them is zero. But in reality, God's love for that sinner is 100%. God really loves that sinner. It's just like the sun shining and the effect of the sun is the same. But then if you get under the sun, that's when you feel the impact the more. But if you get under a shelter, you don't really feel the impact of the sun. Now that's like on the negative. God's love is poured out like that in full measure. Now it's meant for whoever, like scripture says in John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him shall be saved and shall have eternal life, which means the love is the same. The love God pours out for every human being. But then you can decide to magnify that love by receiving the full measure of his love as you keep on relating with him and getting close to him. This is to say, even if you're struggling with sin or you call yourself a sinner, you should have the sense and know that God loves you so much. Why he hates sin is because sin is destroying you as the person that he loves. And it's like, this thing is destroying you and it is hurting me because I love you. It is just like you are having a loved one and cancer is eating up the life or the body of your loved one. Now, you don't hate your loved one for having cancer. But you hate the cancer for destroying this person whom you love. So sin is like that cancer in our soul that God hates because it is destroying the true essence of who God made us to be. It is destroying the true person in us. Like scripture says that the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is why the devil tries to make us to sin. It is his work. First John 3, it says that, the manifestation of the Son of God was to destroy the works of the devil. What is the works of the devil? Is to destroy sin. Now, God is like, how can I destroy sin without destroying the one I love? Now, that is why God sent Christ Jesus, that he sent his only begotten Son, to die. That through his death, everyone who were sinners 
would be saved and receive life by faith. Now we all know that God is holy, but God's holiness is not that which he is tainted by sin, which means it's not like, oh, I'm, I can't get close to sinners because they will stain me, they will stain my holiness. No, that's not the kind of holiness that God has. That's why Jesus came to reveal the heart of God and he made friends with sinners and the Pharisees attacked him. Why are you friends with sinners? Why are you fond of staying with these people? These people are sinners. And he said, I came for these people. I came that sinners might be saved. I didn't come for those who claim that they are righteous. So if you are a sinner, see the heart of love that your father has for you. It is just like that woman in Luke chapter 7 that was there with the Pharisee. And the Pharisee was like, if Jesus would know that this woman is a prostitute, he would not even allow this woman to touch him. Because the woman was crying tears on Jesus' feet and using her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. And he was feeling this, you know, holier than thou. Like, why would Jesus allow this woman to even touch him? Because it's unholy. Yeah, that's according to the law. But to Jesus, revealing the true heart of God because he is the God-man. So he's now showing us how God loves sinners. Jesus said to the Pharisee, by trying to tell him a story, he that is forgiven much is loved much. But he that is forgiven little will love little. Because you that feel like I'm already righteous, you feel like you don't really have much for God to forgive you. But when you know that God came to you to save you as a sinner, you see that he loves you so much for him to decide to be close to you. You see that he loves you so much for him to want to welcome you in your sinfulness. Because he is the one to transform you from your sinfulness to becoming his child, his son or his daughter. So again, I will say, God does not hate the sinner, but he hates sin. Because sin is destroying the sinner whom he loves. So that's why even as a believer in Christ, why you should not dabble with sin is because sin is destructive to you. And God hates sin because sin is destroying you. Whatever sin it is, it is meant to destroy you. It is a system set up to lead you to destruction because its consequences are actually destructive in itself. So God is saying, I don't want you involved in this thing that will destroy you because I love you so much. Now, what is sin? Scripture says that sin is missing the mark, which tells you and I that God has a standard. God has a mark. And missing the mark means you have fallen below the standard of God. And the truth is, no man can ever meet up with the standard of God without God. That is why Christ came, so that anybody that believes in him will actually be saved. Not because the person has been able to keep the law perfectly. Not because the person is righteous in and of theirself, but because Christ has done the work perfectly. And then anybody that comes to God is righteous based on the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And that is to tell all of us that when God gives us a command or a warning or tells us don't do something, it is not because he does not love us, but it's because he loves us and wants to protect us. Number two, sin is deception. The system of sin instituted by the devil is to make you feel like God does not really love you. To make you feel like God doesn't really want you to be free. God doesn't really want the best for you. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. And most times we believe this. We are deceived to believe this. You can see from Genesis chapter 2, when God was giving Adam the warning, God told him, but the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now I want you to see the word freely eat. That shows the freedom which God gave man. And the only thing that he put except is the thing that would destroy man. But the devil wants you to see that God is constricting you and restraining you from being free. But then there were so many trees in the garden. Think about it. That God gave man freedom to eat all except one. Why would you not ask yourself, why does God tell me to avoid this thing? What is God trying to protect me from? So before the devil will bring deception with sin, trying to paint it to look good and tell you, don't mind God. Don't listen to God. You should know that sin is deception and it's a system set up by the enemy of God and your enemy as a child of God to destroy you, to lead you astray. 
And God says, I want to save you. I want you well. I wish that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So God hates sin because it brings deception and it comes with its deceitful lust to draw you away from the standard and purpose of God for your life. And God says, I hate it. I hate it. Not I hate you, but I hate what is eating you up. And this is what I want you to think about. Whenever you hear God's command or his rule and obligations, it is for your benefit. Do not think that God is like our earthly parents who are not perfect. I know some of our parents would give you a rule or a command just for you to obey them because they are the boss. They are in charge. Like I'm your father, I'm your mother, you have to obey me. You must listen to my voice. You are not the one who is bigger than me in this house. Yeah, parents can do that. But then it doesn't mean that that is the picture of God. When God tells you don't do this, he even gives you the freedom so that you might do it if you want to. But then there are consequences when you do. So out of love is like, this is the best for you. I've chosen the best for you already. You don't need to crack your brain trying to look for, God, what, what is the best option I should choose between this and that? He's saying, in my word, I've already ordained what is good for you. I've already ordained what will lead you to the good future that I have for you. But then it is left for you. Are you going to listen to me or are you going by your own wisdom and understanding? That is why scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Because the truth is there's so much deception in the world today. And sin is at the root of it because it brings this deception to draw people away from God's original plan and purposes for each of their individual lives. And in your life, the devil wants to make you sin, whatever the sin is, just to distract you and draw you away through deception. Now, the example I would give you is the devil might make you lie. And you think that you are lying and it's saving you from some things and it's helping you abscond some things. But you know what that lie does? It becomes an habit. And once it becomes an habit, it is making you to always deny truth. And this will come to a point that when God tells you the truth about you, you cannot believe that truth because you've made a habit of denying truth. So when God tells you you're wonderfully and fearfully made, you're like, I'm not sure. There's no evidence. I can't believe this. But because the devil has made you lie, and get used to lie and be comfortable lying. So as a child of God, scripture says, don't lie, but speak the truth one to another. Put off that old sinful nature and put on your new nature, being redeemed by Christ. Number three, sin is a distraction. In this point, I want to talk about Joseph in Genesis. Joseph knew better. That is why when Potiphar's wife came to Joseph, to distract him from his destiny, from his future. He knew God had great plans for him. He knew God ordained great things for his future and for his life. That's why when she came to Joseph, scripture tells that Joseph replied her, no one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you. That's talking about the master. Because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Now, let me explain this what Joseph is thinking about so that you can see his integrity that he is not distracted from his integrity, he is not distracted from his purpose, his focus is being kept. He says, my master has given me everything. He has been nice to me. He has put everything under my authority except you because you are his wife. Now he says, how can I do such wicked thing to my master? Oh, that's integrity. The master is not there. The wife wants that. He can do it and abscond and think in the worldly sense, yeah, now I would have more favor in this house, but that would be in thinking small and falling short of the standard of God and missing the mark. Because God has kept a mark for him, a higher bar than what his natural mind could even try to think or imagine. And then showing us where his heart is and sin against God. He did not say sin against my master because that wasn't, he was not putting his life in the standard of his master. If it's based on the standard of his master, maybe Joseph's master might have been having his own mistresses. And then Joseph is like, oh, my master is doing it outside. So if that's the standard, 
then I might as well just get on with his wife. You know, the wife wants to pay back, so let me help her. But that wasn't Joseph's mindset and his focus. His focus was God. It's like, God is the one. And if I do this, I'll be distracted. This sin that is coming to me, that is designed, is only designed to distract me. And every sin that comes into our life as Christians, mostly is coming to distract us from God. Distracting us from our purpose, from what God has for us, from the great future and the impact and the influence that God has ordained us to walk into. Oh no, that's why you should not dabble into it. So Joseph was here saying, my loyalty is to God alone. I am loyal to him. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want anything to take away my focus. And sin can take away focus. Whether it's sin of sexual sin, of whatever kind of sin, it can take away your focus from God so quick. And that is why God hates sin. Because it will distract you, to distract you from destiny, to distract you from purpose. Now, fast forward to two years after the imprisonment, that he was wrongfully imprisoned, Joseph is now the second in command in Egypt. Wow. <laughs> now it's so beautiful because I was imagining Joseph seeing Potiphar's wife and I'm like, what would go through his mind? He would just be like, God, thank you. So I would have missed my destiny like this because of what? A distraction. So every sin at the bottom of it is distraction. It's just to distract you. It means the devil is wise enough to know that you have a great future. It means the devil knows that God has something great and amazing for you. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. And thinking about Joseph being the governor, the prime minister, or whatever you want to call him, being second in command. Such a beautiful thing that he will be looking at Potiphar's wife. Just smile. Be like, God, I thank you. And Potiphar's wife will actually be ashamed. Kind of. I don't know. But then it is something to think about. Just the freedom that Joseph is like, God, I'm grateful. God, thank you for helping me. And then he will be proud of himself for listening to God and obeying God's word. And that is what joy we could experience if we only tell ourselves, this distraction is not going to get my focus. Number four, sin is a counterfeit. Now, sin is presented with its deceitfulness, promising you what you truly desire, but cannot deliver on that promise. I want to say that again. Whenever sin is presented to you, it's presented to you in a way that you truly desire to do those things. You want it. You love it. Enjoying your life and doing the things that everybody else is doing. Even as a married man, you feel attraction for another woman who is beautiful. Yeah. She's beautiful to you. It doesn't mean your wife isn't beautiful, but she is pulling you. And you would want to just for a bit. But then when you discover that, Whatever thing that feeling is promising you, it cannot fulfill. It cannot deliver on that promise. That's when you should withdraw yourself and drag yourself back. And the devil is trying to present to you a counterfeit. Whereby you'll be disgraced. You'll be shamed at the end of the day. So every distraction the devil brings is a counterfeit. Which is sin itself is a counterfeit. Whenever the devil is trying to pull you into things through your true desires, just like he caught Jesus when he was hungry, he was like trying to tell him, you know, you can turn his stones to bread. You know, he, he, I can give you everything. He can't deliver on any of those promises that he was telling. And that's why sometimes we are caught up in this deception, thinking the devil can actually deliver on what he promises because he has no power. He only operates by counterfeit. That's why even if we want to talk about wealth, People that go to the devil on all these ways to get wealth. That's why it does not last. That's the counterfeit. Because they will just have it maybe for a period of five years. And after that, everything is gone. Their life is gone with it too. What did the devil just do? It's for you to think, what sin is in my life that is a counterfeit, that is promising something to me that I truly desire, but it is not the promise of God. Now let's go to the story in Genesis. The devil told Eve in Genesis chapter 3, You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God. Now that was the promise. He's telling Eve, God knows your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Now I want you to mark that point. That is the promise. But 
Don't forget that God made Adam and Eve in his own image, in his own likeness. We talked about sin being a deception and we talked about it being distraction. Now, this is a counterfeit promise because it's not true. Let's read down. Knowing both good and evil, the woman was convinced. Now she's deceived. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Now the counterfeit promise of disobeying God, which is sin, and missing the mark of God, they could not deliver on the promise that it made to them. And what happened? The next verse said, At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Don't forget the promise was, your eyes will be opened truly. That was right. And you'll be like God. But then when the result came, their eyes were opened and they felt shame. The shame they never had before. The shame that was never even part of their story. The shame they, that was not registered and locked into them before. That's the experience. Now their eyes was opened, but this promise was a counterfeit promise. It didn't deliver on what it promised. Eve loved that because she was like, oh wow, such a wisdom that I will get. And sometimes in our life, we find ourselves in that place that counterfeit promises from the devil is what we embrace and welcome into our lives and we walk into and end up destroying our life and the future God has for us. Whatever sin it is, it is just like the devil trying to pull a man to try and find his value by sleeping with many women just for body count. It will be like, oh, yeah, when I was small, no woman could look at me. No woman could accept me. You know, could even count about the ladies that insulted him and all of that. And now he's able to sleep with all these ladies. The devil telling him, when you do all of now, when you do all of this now, your value is now obtained. Now you have value. Now you are valuable. No. God already made you unique and valuable. God says you are important to me. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now the devil is giving you a counterfeit promise that would only distract you and destroy you at the end of the day because it makes you lose focus this is what consumes you and if you would even understand the power that sex carries that it goes beyond the pleasure the power of sex goes beyond the pleasure it gives and that would be a video for another time but if you would really know and go to do your study what is the power of sex what does it do so you would consider that sleeping with the number of women you sleep with you think you're having pride, but then it is destruction to you because it is a counterfeit promise. It could promise you that you could, you know, run away from your loneliness, but instead of running away from loneliness, it leads you down to depression. So whatever sin can promise you, it can never deliver on that promise. It will take you further than you want to go. And just for another example, which I know you can give me more examples in the comment section and of stories that you've heard. Somebody that says, Oh, let me just drink and forget my sorrow. Scripture says, alcohol is for the dying and wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their troubles no more. But now, the base effect of this is you are drinking every time you have sorrow to forget it instead of being vulnerable and dealing with it and being sober on your own. You need alcohol to be sober and forget. At that point, what happens to you is in the later time of your life, because you've been forgetting your story, you start forgetting things, you start forgetting yourself, and it becomes a sickness that has a name. So all of this is, every sin the devil takes you into, it is a counterfeit just to distract and pull you away from the very purpose that God has for your life. Number five, as the last point, is that every sin is rooted in unbelief. Whenever sin presents itself to anybody, any child of God, and the person decides to go into it, whether the person believes in Christ or not, anybody that's committing sin does not believe in God. Sin actually means, God, I can't trust you. Yeah, I know these promises are beautiful, but I, I don't think that you'll do it. I don't think you'll do it for me. You can do it for the pastor. Maybe you can do it for the other sister. Maybe you can do it for the other brother. Or maybe, like, for example, a sister in church could say, Maybe God, you can give this sister a husband because she is actually doing well. She's not really, you know, she has not really had a past like mine. So maybe she could have a husband. But for me, I don't think you would do that for me. So I have to sleep around with this man. 
maybe one of them would accept me. You know, you've already fallen short. You don't believe God. Because if you would believe him, you would know that this God loves you. And he says, I still love you. You feel like I don't. I still do. Forget about the religious voices that is telling you that I don't love you because you've sinned. I love you. That is why my son died. And my son's death is for everybody that believes. So if you know that I love you, then why are you doing this? So God doesn't sit in heaven and be like, Oh, this child is doing it again. Why? And then boiling. God doesn't sit in heaven and go that way. God is sitting in heaven and he's grieving. If only you would know that I love you. If only you would know that I care. Because that is my heart to you. I am not here to tell you run away from me oh, because I'm going to kill you because you committed sin. No. He says you committed sin. Yeah, I made provision for your sins. Come to me. Jesus said, come to me all you that labor and are of every learning and I will give you rest. That is the welcome. Every sin is rooted in unbelief. You don't believe in God. You don't believe in the provision of God. That's why people go to steal. You don't believe in the providence of God. You don't believe in the wisdom of God. You don't believe in the favor of God. You start acting out in favoritism, trying to look for a way to maneuver and do it your own way, as if to help God bring his promise to pass. Like Abraham going in to Hagar, trying to help God with his promise. And God says, no, that's not the promise I made for you. Scripture says, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. What is faith? Faith is believing in the word of God, that God is who he says he is. So if you really believe in God, then sin would not be the next response. And again, in James it says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So all of this is to tell you, whenever you see unbelief, there's going to be sin. Whichever area you're struggling with sin, ask yourself the question, what do I not believe God for? Sit down and ask yourself the question, what am I not believing God for in my life that is leading me to these things? Because in truth, those are not just things that you get to do. They are things that you do because of something that you don't trust God for. You're trying to get it done by yourself. You're trying to figure it out by yourself. Or maybe you could even be in the area of God giving you promise that I'm getting you to this place. And you're like, I don't really think I can get there, God. I still sin. God says, I will do it for you. Like in the story of the Israelites, when they were to enter the land of Canaan, they sent spies to spy the land. God has already given them promise, I will lead you to this land. And when the spies came back, 10 of them turned away and disbelieved God and start spoiling the minds of the people. Like we can't possess that land. They are giants there. They will kill us. We are like grasshoppers, even in their own eyes. Gosh. And your God said, I am the one to lead you. It is not by your strength. It is through me. So that unbelief in God made God destroy them in the wilderness because they did not believe. God said, well, you've already made the decision for yourself. You don't want to enter the land like I promised you. So none of you is going to enter anyways. So for us as believers in today's world, we have a promise of God, a promise of rest, a promise of heaven, a promise of eternal life. And if you don't believe God, that God is true to his word. Oh, what a pity for us to be in that place. We need to come to a place of faith, of knowing that God said it, he's going to do it. Nothing in hell or nothing in the whole wide world can stop God from doing as he promised, from doing as he said. And scripture says in Hebrews, be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. When God tells you, I have a beautiful future ahead of you, I have great plans for you, your response should be, God, I believe it. Your response shouldn't be, ah, I need to look for a way to do it by my own self. Your response should be, God, I'm going to trust you. I'll take you at your word. I hope this video is beneficial to you and valuable and I hope you've gained something from this video even if it's one thing. Let me know in the comment section what spoke to you from this video. It is such a pleasure to have you watch this channel and visit me in this channel. So thank you so much for watching. 
it is a pleasure don't forget to hit the like button so that youtube can spread this message to other people who would need to hear it and do not forget to hit the subscribe button to follow up with other things that i'm doing on this channel i talk about relationship the christian life and the christian work and then i have so many things that i hate that i want to share so don't forget to watch my next video and don't forget to go and check out my previous videos thank you so much and god bless you bye bye